Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. And seeing the multitude, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all men of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice, and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. So persecuted they the prophets which were before you. This morning as we continue in our series entitled A Composite of the Christian's Character, you recall on last week in the introduction to this series, I gave you my motivation for doing this series. Remember I said that this series was motivated by a question that was asked to me by a brother who asked the question, Brother Smith, how can you know when a person is a Christian? And I demonstrated to you last week that everyone in the body of Christ, everyone in the church of Christ is not a Christian that the scriptures teach that the enemy has come in and has sown some tares among the wheat, and that they have some people in the church who, who's working for the devil and not for God. And the scriptures conclude that they will be in the body until the end when the Lord dispatches his angels to come in to pluck them out of the kingdom. I showed you last week how to identify those who are weak, who are tares. I gave you a principle from Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20, when the law said that you can know a tree by the fruit it bears. This is how you can identify those who are and who is not. Last week I also gave an outline of the Sermon on the Mount. And you recall I said that the Sermon on the Mount was divided into three sections. Section 1, we have the kingdom characteristics, those character traits that the, the child of God should possess. And this we call the Beatitudes. I talked about the influence that a child of God would have as a result of having these character traits. That we would be salt and that we would be light. And our purpose for being an influence is that we impact our environment. And while I'm flying through here, let me just say this. That if you don't make a difference, then you're useless to go. Because the purpose of our having influence, the purpose of our making an impact, is to make a difference in the lives, in the lives of those whose lives we touch. And so if your job is not better as a result of your being there, then you're useless to God. If your home is not better as a result of your being there, then you're useless to God. Did not Jesus say that salt had lost its saltiness? It's good for nothing but to be drawn out and trodden up under the foot of men. So influence is only good when you use it. Then the Sermon on the Mount deals with the righteousness that should prevail in the kingdom of God. God's standard of righteousness is different from the world's standard of righteousness and the Pharisees' standard of righteousness. And this is what these examples that the Lord gave and turn to Matthew chapter 5. Let me show you the key verse in this entire discourse because there is a verse in the Sermon on the Mount that the whole sermon hinges upon. Matthew 5 verse number 20 the scripture says for I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees you shall in no case enter the kingdom of God. Brothers and sisters this is the key verse of the whole Sermon on the Mount. This is the theme scripture. 
because you recall last week, I showed up in chapter verse 17, where Jesus said, Think not that I've come to destroy the law, but I've not come to destroy, but to what? Fulfill. But to fulfill. And I showed you last week that Jesus was accused by the Pharisees of trying to de destroy the law. And that word destroy, I said, meant to make void. It meant to annul, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is what they accused Jesus of doing. But he said, I didn't come to make void the law. I didn't come to annul the law. I came to fulfill the law. In other words, to properly interpret the law. And then what he did after that was he gave a series of examples demonstrated how the, the Pharisees interpreted the law. And then he gave the proper interpretation of it. Remember I showed you last week when Jesus said, it had been said, love your neighbor and hate your enemies, but I say unto you, you see, the Pharisees were interpreting, making interpretations of the law and applying it that it didn't really apply to. So Jesus says, except your righteousness shall exceed or surpass or go beyond the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. You see, the Pharisees and the scribes misinterpreted, and get from the Matthew chapter 23, beginning with verse number 1. Scribes and the Pharisees misinterpreted and misapplied the scriptures. But Jesus said that we must not be like the Pharisees are. In Matthew chapter 23, let me give you an example of the kind of thing that the Lord was dealing with here. Matthew 23, verse 1, the book says what? Then spake Jesus to, then the, spake multitude, Jesus to the multitude and said, and said to the disciples, saying, saying, the scribes, the scribes and, the and the Pharisees sit in, sit in Moses, Moses' seat. Now that's, that means authority. The scribes and Pharisees sit in a position of authority. Okay, read. All therefore, all therefore, whatsoever, whatsoever they bid, they bid observe, observe. Okay, that observe, that observe and, and do. do. But what's the problem? Read. But do not, but do not be after, ye their, after works. their works, for they say, for they say, and do not, and do not. You see, what they are doing is they're being hypocrites. Right. They're in a position of authority, so they're going to tell you what to do, and they have the right to tell you what to do, right. but they don't do they themselves, mm -hmm. you see. Uh, let's drop down to verse 5. But oh, boy, boy, read, read 4. we got to get all of this. For well, they, they being heavy burdens, buying heavy burdens and grief, grievous to, the to be born, and lay, and and lay them on men's men shoulders. shoulders. But they, but they themselves will not move, will not move with, with one, one of their, of their fingers. fingers. Read. But all their works. All their do. works. Here's the motive now. For to be seen. They of men. do for to be seen of men. That's their motive for mm -hmm. doing what they do. To be seen of men. Drop down to verse number twelve. And whatsoever. And whatsoever. Shall, and whosoever. And whosoever shall, shall exalt himself. himself Read. Shall be shall be abased, abased or humble, and he and that he shall that shall humble himself, himself shall be shall exalted. Be exalted. You see what the Pharisees were doing? What they were sitting in the position of authority. They were binding things on people that they didn't do themselves. They were making a big production about the things they were doing. Why? To be seen of men. They were puffed up with pride. But the law said, if you puff yourself up, if you exalt yourself, God is going to humble you. But if you humble yourself, God will exalt you. Yeah. And as leaders in the body of Christ, brothers and sisters, we must practice what we preach. Yeah. Many of our leaders fall into the trap of misinterpreting and misapplying the scriptures for their own personal benefits. Many of our leaders preach one thing and practice another, which is hypocrisy. Many of our leaders have selfish motives for doing the things that they do, like the Pharisees, such as pride and arrogance. Right. But the scripture says that if we are to be an influence in the world, if we are to be effective in the kingdom, our righteousness have to exceed, have to surpass, have to go beyond the hypocritical righteousness of the Pharisees right. and scribes. Last week also, I showed that the Beatitudes 
not only gives us a composite, not only gives us a picture of what the child of God looks like, but it also discloses the source of true happiness. I define the word beatitude coming out of a Latin word beatus, which means happy or blessed. And you remember I said that happiness was serendipitous. Happiness is not the result of you looking for it. If you're looking for happiness, you'll never find it. But happiness comes as a result of doing something else. I talked about the word makirios. I defined that word, blessing, makirios. And I said that the etymology of this word comes from three sources, that the word was originally used to describe the gods who had no need for physical and human things like we do, so they didn't have the cares that we had. Then I described it as coming out of the background of those who had died, and so they no longer had need. They were beyond the reach of pain and suffering and all of the things that we need. So they were materials. Then it described those who were rich, those who had physical means, had money, and so that wasn't an issue. They didn't have the same issues and problems that we had. And the point being that Jesus was trying to show us that in order for us to live a life that's unburdened by the cares of the world, in order for us to have a life of peace and tranquility and not constantly be stressed out about the issues of life, about the burdens of life, he gives us a prescription that we call the Beatitude. So this morning, we're going to examine the Beatitudes. Turn back to Matthew chapter 5. Let's get into the book now, and let's see what the scripture said. Let's unlock it to a blessed life. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 3. What's the first word? Blessed. Blessed. Keep that in mind. And you remember I said that a hermeneutical hint is that whenever you see a word repeated over and over again in the text, that it has some significance. Right? And the significance here is that this is our word makirios. This is the word for happiness. This is how we become happy. Okay? He said, blessed what? Are the poor. Blessed spirit. Are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Huh? Is the kingdom of heaven. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Prescription number one for happiness to be makirios, above, unburdened about affairs of this world, he says, is to be poor in spirit. Now notice what he did not say. He did not say, blessed are the poor, for they shall inherit the kingdom of their heart. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, there are two Greek words that's translated by one English word, poor. There's the word panakros. And the word panakros means to be needy. It means to be poverty stricken. It describes the widow that had the two mites. That's all she had were those two mites but she had something. Then there's the word tukas. And the word tukas means to be destitute. Get from me, uh, Luke 19, verse 20. Luke 16, verse 20. Tukas means to be destitute. Tukas means to have nothing. You see, panakras means you're poor, you're poverty stricken, you have very little, but two cars means you don't have anything. Now let me show you another word in the scripture. And, and there was a certain and beggar. There was a certain what? Beggar. Beggar named Lazarus. Named Lazarus. Read. Which was laid at which laid at the rich man's gate, gate full of swords. Full of swords. Read. 
and desiring to be and fed desiring to be fed with the crumbs with the crumbs which fell from which the fell rich man's, from the table. Table. man's table thank you this man didn't have anything mm -hmm. this man had to be brought to the gate of the king's house this man full of sores had medical problems and the only medicine the only medical treatment that he got was the licking his sores this man was so poor, he didn't have any food of his own. He had to desire the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. That word beggar in Luke chapter 16, 20 is the same Greek word that Jesus used for poor in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. It's the word two house. Now, why did the Lord use this word? What is the purpose of poor in spirit? Poor in spirit. Tukas is an attitude of humility. It's an attitude of being totally dependent upon someone else to provide your needs. Incidentally, right in your, the margin of your Bible, by verse number three, write the word condition. Because Tukas, poor in spirit, is you recognizing your spiritual condition before God. You are recognizing that in and of yourself, you are insufficient to supply your own needs. Being too kind, being poor in spirit, is the antithesis of being full of one's self. It is the opposite of being full of pride. Because you see, if you're full of pride, you cannot recognize your need for God because you believe that you can supply your own needs. Poor in spirit is the key prescription to a happy life, to a life of mercurios, living above, unburdened from the pressures and the, the burdens of the world. Why? Because unless you have this attitude of humility, unless you recognize your total and utter dependence upon God, you will not have the other character traits in the beatitude. If you are not poor in spirit, you cannot mourn. If you are full of pride, you cannot be meek, and you will not be merciful. Without this character trait, you will be full of pride. Let me give you an example. Luke chapter 18 verses 9 through 14. Let me show you a man, two men, who are classic illustrations of the difference between being two cops and being full of pride. Luke 18, verse number 9, the scripture said, and he said this parable unto certain, and he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. You see the problem? that he's given an interest. Number one, they trusted in themselves. That's pride. And two, they despised others. That's self-righteousness, <laughs> you see? And so in order to address this issue, the Lord teaches them a parable. And here's what he says, verse 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee and the other a publican. Now, the Pharisees were the religious elite of the day. They were the doctors of the law. They were the ones who interpreted the law to the people, okay? The publicans were considered traitors by the Jew. They were, were Jews that sold themselves to the Roman government to collect taxes for the, for the present government. So they were hated by God's people. Verse 11. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not like other men or extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. That's his attitude. Pride, puffed up. This is what I do. This is how I'm not. Now look at the publican's attitude, verse 13. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Here's the principle. 
verse 14. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Why? For everyone that exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humbled himself shall be exalted. You see, this publican's attitude was one of us. He recognized the fact that he was not even worthy to come into the temple. He recognized the fact that he was a sinner before God and that he was totally unworthy to even be there. Brothers and sisters, this is the attitude that we have to have in order to have to live a blessed life, in order to live a happy life, we have to recognize our total dependence upon God. We have to be, as Lazarus was, a beggar, utterly dependent upon someone else recognizing our spiritual condition before God. Remember the wise man said in Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not upon thine own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. You have to be poor in spirit in order to apply this text. You have to be poor in spirit in order to trust in the Lord with all of your heart. When you cannot see how God is going to work something out, when you don't know where your next meal is coming from, or your next bill is going to be paid, you have to be two cops in order to trust God. He says, when you are poor in spirit, yours is the kingdom of heaven. And that has reference to possessing the kingdom of heaven. Not entering, because he's dealing, he's talking about characteristics when you're in the kingdom. So he's not talking about you will enter into, he's talking about you will possess the kingdom of God. Okay? Mm -hmm. Second, Matthew chapter 5, verse number 4. The scripture say what? Blessed are they Blessed that mourn. More curious are they that what? Mourn. That mourn. Why? For they shall, for be, they comforted. shall be comforted. Now this beatitude contradicts the prevailing attitude in our society. Because we live in a society that's oriented and geared towards pleasure. We live in a society that, you know, thrives on having fun and thrives on being entertained, even in religion. And if we are not careful, brothers and sisters, our motive for even trying to worship God, for even trying to assemble with the saints, will be one of being entertained. And that's one of Satan's most effective tools, religion. And if he can make it palatable to you, if he can make it more pleasing to you, he will hook you because of your need to be entertained. There are several Greek words for our word mourn. I'm not going to give you all, but let me just give you the one that the scriptures use. This is the word mourn. It's from the Greek word pantheon. Blessed are those that pantheon mourn. The word mourn or pantheon is the strongest word for grief in the New Testament. It's the picture of a person standing at a grave site and watching a loved one being lowered in the cold belly of the earth. Have you ever had that experience? Have you ever been to a grave site and seen someone being lowered into the ground and the family member just lose it, just cry hysterically? That's your word for more. Right by that word, right by that text, the word contrite or contrition, C-O-N-T-R-I-T-I-O-N, contrition. It means to be broken hearted. Matter of fact, I don't know if you know this or not, but Luke gives an account of the Beatitudes in Luke chapter 6. And in Luke's account of this particular Beatitude, Luke 6 verse 21, 
Luke says, Blessed are they that weep, for they shall laugh eventually. But the idea of being broken hearted is the idea of being broken hearted expressed in tears. Question. What are we to mourn about? And while I'm flying through here, he said, Blessed are they that mourn and not they that moan. You know the difference between mourn and moan? See, a lot of people moan over their condition. Moan means to complain, to murmur, to, you know, to be expressed discontent. He didn't say, blessed are they that moan. He said, blessed are they that mourn. Now, what are we to be mournful over? Number one, our own spiritual condition. You see, when we sin against God, it should break our heart. We should be broken hearted over the fact that that we sin against our God. You remember Peter in Matthew chapter 26 after the Lord told Peter that uh, you shall deny. Well, Peter made this, this grand confession that Lord, I will go with you not only to prison but into death. And Jesus said, Peter, the cock should not crow this night before you deny me three times. And Peter said, no, I won't deny you. And you remember the story how that Peter did deny the Lord three times. And in Matthew chapter 26, beginning with verse number 69 through 75, we find that when Peter finally did recognize, when he heard that cock crow, and he remembered what the law said, the scripture said that he wept bitterly. He mourned his condition. Remember David. Let me ask you a question. How can David, a man who saw another man's wife, and he lusted after her. And he took her. He committed adultery with another man's wife. And then when the woman became pregnant, he plotted up a scheme to deceive the woman's husband to make him think that that was his child. When that didn't work, he had the man killed. So you got adultery compounded by deception, compounded by murder. Question. How can a man like that be described in Scripture as a man after God's own heart? Let's turn to Matthew to Psalm 51 and let me show you how David was described as a man after God's own heart. Psalms 51, verse number 1. Scripture says what? Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Now this is David after he had been you know, judged by the prophet Nathan after the prophet told him what he had done before God. This was his attitude after he had been told this. He says, have mercy on me. Read. O God, o God according, to, according thy to thy loving kindness, loving kindness according, according to unto the, the multitude, multitude of thy tender mercies. Do what? Blot out, Blot out my transgressions. Read. Wash me, wash me thoroughly from my from my iniquities and cleanse and cleanse me from my sin. From my sin. Verse three. For I for I acknowledge my transgressions, my transgressions and my sin and my sin is, is ever, ever before, me. before me. Read against thee against thee the only the only have I sinned have I sin and done this and evil, done this evil in thy sight in thy sight that thou mightest. Be justified that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be and clear, clear when thou justice. Now drop down to verse number 10. He says what? Create in me, Create in me a clean heart, O God, o God and, re and renew within me renew a right spirit, a right within, spirit me. within me. Verse 13. Then will I teach, then will I teach transgressors, transgressors thy ways. ways. And sinners, and sinners shall be converted, shall be converted unto, sin. unto thee. Verse 16. For thou desirest, For thou desirest not sacrifice. And here's the key. Read. Else would Else I, would I give, it. give it. Thou, thou desirest not in burnt offerings. In burnt offerings. Verse 17. Thy sacrifice the sacrifices of God, of God are, broken are a broken spirit. And a broken, a spirit, broken spirit and, and a, a contrite heart. heart. 
Oh God, uh, thou wilt thou not will not despise. despise. Why could David be considered a man after God's own heart after he'd done all these terrible things? Because his attitude was that even though I have these weaknesses, even though I have this, you know, these flaws in my character, I still love God. And I'm going to humble myself before God, and I'm going to acknowledge my sin, and I'm going to ask God to create in me a clean heart and renew within me a right spirit, and I'm going to take the lessons that I learned and teach others and convert them to God. Amen. Brothers and sisters, that's being having an attitude of mourning. That's why David, despite his flaws, could be considered a man after God's own heart. And I have a question for you this morning. How do you feel about your sins? Some people sin and they rationalize, well, I sin, but maybe if I just give more money, maybe if I do a little extra, do a little something, you know, above and beyond call of duty, that'll make it all right. Some people brush it off and just say, well, listen, we're living under grace. You know, the Bible said that you know, no matter what I do, God's grace is going to cover it. So they just brush off the thing and claim God's grace and say, that's going to straighten it out. Some people are brokenhearted by their spiritual condition. Some people, when they sin against God, they are brokenhearted about it. And they immediately go to the throne of God and beg God's forgiveness after having acknowledged their sins. Question, which one are you? Don't raise your hand. I don't need to know. It's between you and God. The scripture said in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, that God let sorrow produces repentance. And unless you experience godly sorrow, unless you are brokenhearted, by your condition, your spiritual condition, you will not be moved to repentance. People say all the time, I sinned, I repented of my sin, and I have to That's reporting. That's not repenting. Repenting means to be brokenhearted about what you have done, and you ask God to forgive you. Number two, what should we mourn about? We should mourn over the spiritual condition of our world. Luke chapter 19, verse number 41. Jesus, after he had entered into Jerusalem, the scripture says, when he had thus spoken, he went before ascending up to Jerusalem. We come out to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he went, he sent two disciples, two of the disciples saying, Go ye to the village all against you, and in which at your entering you shall find a coat tie, whereupon never man set. Loose him and bring him hither. If any man asks you, Why do you loose him? Thus you shall say unto him, Because the Lord had need of him. And they that were sent went their way and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the coat, owners thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the coat? And he said, The Lord had need of him. And as they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the coat, and they set Jesus upon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice, and praise God with a loud voice, loud voice for all the mighty works that he they had seen, saying, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And when he was come there, he beheld the city and wept over it because of their spiritual condition that God was going to judge Jerusalem that God was going to destroy the city, the, the temple in Jerusalem 
And this came to pass in AD 70 when the Roman armies came and besieged the city of Jerusalem and killed millions of Jews and destroyed the city. But here's the point. When the Lord looked at the city and the Lord knew the consequences of what, what happened to that city as a result of their disobedience, the scripture says that Jesus wept for the city. The question is, how do you feel about our city? Do you weep because of the crime in our city? Did you weep when you read in the paper yesterday of an 18-year-old boy gunned down in a drive-by shooting? Do you weep because of the innocent lives that are taken at the hands of criminals every day? Do you weep because of the injustices that are in our world. I clipped this out of the newspaper yesterday. The conflict over in Kosovo, the Serbs, you know, and the Yugoslavians, that they, they're killing all of these Alban Albanians. This is a torture chamber that they discovered in Pristina, Yugoslavia. And they found the body of 196 people in this box. They also found brass knuckles and whips and clubs and things that were used to kill these people. Question, how do you feel about that? Does this cause you to weep? Do we weep over these kinds of things? If we don't, if we don't feel anything about this, brothers and sisters, we won't be motivated to do anything about it. I saw a movie a few weeks ago, American Justice X, a movie about a skinhead who hated black people. We talked about it this morning. He was indoctrinated with his hatred of black people. And so he went through his early years hating black people. But under him was a younger brother who idolized him and he went to prison for murdering two black men. And while he was in prison, he became reformed. And he renounced his racist attitudes. But his younger brother fell under the same influence that he was under. And at the end of the movie, when he came out of prison, and he tried to get his younger brother to renounce this way of life, you know, try to show his brother that this was wrong, that this was not right to have this kind of mentality. And finally, when he made some progress with his brother, because of a conflict that his brother got into with a young black man earlier in the movie, after he decided to renounce this way, he went into the bathroom and his young black man came in there and killed him. And when this older brother came into the bathroom and saw his young brother laying there dead, he went down, he fell down, and picked up his blood-soaked brother's body, and he cried, and he mourned, and he wept. Why? And he said, what have I done? What have I done? You see, his influence on his younger brother caused his younger brother to be killed. And now he felt the pain of that. He was brokenhearted over his part in causing his brother to die. Question, how do we feel? And this, this was a movie, but this happens in real life, you see? And if we don't have a broken heart about these kinds of things, if we don't have a broken heart about the injustices, if we don't mourn over these kinds of things, brothers and sisters, we are not going to be motivated to go out here and make a difference. We must follow the example of Jesus. We must make a difference Amen. in the world. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. Scripture says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was at all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. The Lord came to this earth and he experienced all of the injustices of this world. He experienced the, the rejection of being rejected by your own people like I have.
So he relates to my pain when I go through these things. And he relates to your pain when you go through the things that you go through. That's why we can go to him. Because as we sing in the song, Jesus knows all about our struggles. And he will guide to the day is through. John 11. You remember Lazarus? You remember the brother of Martha and Mary? And turn there. John 11, verse 31, beginning. And I'm going to show you that Jesus set an example for us to follow. And if Jesus can be touched by certain things, then we should be touched by these same kinds of things. John 11, verse 31, beginning. Now Lazarus had died. Remember, they sent for Jesus and told him that Lazarus was sick. And Jesus said, he's not sick, he's just sleeping. But he died. And when he came back to the city, this is what he found. John 11, verse 36, 31, beginning. The book says what? The Jews then, which were the Jews then that were with her in the house, in the house and, comforted and comforted her when they saw, when they saw Mary, Mary, that she, that she rolled, rolled up hastily, hastily and, and went out. Followed, followed her, saying, saying she, goeth she goeth unto the grave, grave to weep there. Read. Then when Mary was, then when come, Mary was come where Jesus, where Jesus was, was and, and saw, saw him, she fell she down, fell down at his feet, feet saying, saying unto, unto him, the Lord, Lord, if thou, if had thou had been, been, been here, my brother, my had, brother not had not died. Read. When Jesus therefore, when saw, Jesus her therefore weeping, saw her weeping, and the Jews also, and the Jews weeping, also which weeping, came with which her, came with her, what happened? He groaned in, his, he in, groaned the, spirit, in the spirit and was troubled. And, was troubled. Read. and said, and said where, have, where he have he laid him? Read. They said, they unto, said him, unto him, Lord, Lord come, and see. come and see. Now what's the next verse? The shortest verse in all of the scriptures said what? Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Now why did Jesus weep? Verse 36. Then said the Jews, then said the Jews Behold, how, Behold he how he loved him. Brothers and sisters, Jesus was touched by the pain of Martha and Mary. Jesus was moved by the fact that Lazarus, a man whom he loved, had died. You see that? And if we don't have love for people, if we don't love these people that the Lord died for, not only the people who were killed, but the people who killed them, if we don't love them, we will not be motivated to do anything about it. Well, brothers, we're not in uh, Yugoslavia. We don't have anything that we could do from here about them. Well, what about the people in our neighborhood? What about the people on our job? What about the people in our school? What about the people we do have access to? About the things that we do know about? The same principle applies. If we don't love them, if we don't have compassion on them, if we don't mourn their condition, then we will not be motivated to do anything about it. If we are to demonstrate that we are children of God, and you remember the series, the composite of the Christian's character, if we don't demonstrate that we have this character trait, the ability to mourn over other people's spiritual condition, then we won't have the influence that we need to have, and therefore we won't make the impact that we need to make in this life. When you mourn, or with your own spiritual condition, when you mourn over the condition of the world, when you mourn over the, the uh, injustices and the trials and tribulations and pain and suffering of your fellow man, when you do that, the scriptures say that you are mercurious. Now, what's the promise? Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. The word comfort comes from the Greek word parakaleo. Let me write it down. Parakaleo. 
And the word means to call to one's side. It means to summon, to exhort, to console, to strengthen. So when we mourn, the scripture said that God will comfort us, that God will console us, that God will strengthen us. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. Apostle Paul says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of what? All comfort, who comforted us in all our tribulations, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort where we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abound by Christ. What is he saying? He's saying that, listen, if we have an attitude, if we have an attitude of being mournful about our conditions, about the conditions of others, then we will be comforted by God. And the comfort that we receive from God, we share with other people to help comfort them through their mourning. You see how it works? That's why it's so powerful, brothers and sisters, that we understand these Beatitudes. And all I'm going to deal with this morning are these two. And I'm going to take my time with them because there's so much information, there's so many blessings in these Beatitudes. I don't want to run through this information. If you're here this morning and you have been searching for happiness, number one, if you've been searching for it, you'll never find it. Because as I said, happiness is serendipitous. Happiness is as a result of being poor in spirit. Recognizing your condition of being totally dependent upon God. Happiness is as a result of being pentheal, being mournful over the, your condition and condition of others. Happiness is a result of being meek. I'm going to describe to you what that means next week. But these are the things that we have to do to, number one, be identified as the children of God. These are the character traits that we have to possess in order to be recognized as children of God and it's the prescription to true happiness. So if you're here this morning and you've been looking for happiness, keep coming because God has given us the prescription for happiness. And the things that we learn, we need to share them with others because that's our whole purpose. Our purpose is to go out and to seek to save the lost. And there are people who have so many issues and so many problems in the world that we have access to the answers to. So when we learn it, and when God blesses our lives, then we in turn need to go and touch and bless other lives.